today and a lecture on Thursday at 1. Uh, today, they're all, for the lab time, we'll have a discussion on anything you want to talk about. And if you don't have anything, I have some things. And we'll meet in our regular sessions, in other words, at uh, 2 o'clock and at 7 o'clock. And on Thursday, they'll just be the lecture only. Yes. Uh, what, well, but basically, what, what you, it's open for what you want to discuss. Things, I've told you the things that I think are important for the wine microbiologist to know, but there may be things that you think are important, and I hope you've been thinking about some things that we can talk about. I, I will say that I'm, I'm not worried about us finding things to talk about. This class has been especially good at, uh, as far as discussions and interrupting. No. <laughs> no, you really have been. So I, and I, I, it's kind of a new idea to do it, but I think that'll uh, go over. Okay. Uh, your wine strain, wine yeast strain report uh, is supposed to be in today and, and everything else uh, that, that is, as far as written reports are supposed to be due today, we're not really being very uh, penalty minded if they're, uh, you know, a few minutes late or a few hours <laughs> or tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Um, would you, I, a lot of you are doing an extra project and it's, uh, I've tried to keep it in track of my mind or written down what the extra projects are, but it'd be helpful if you haven't already or in one of your, report, your, in one of your reports, if you haven't written down what that extra project is, if you've done one, it'd be good to turn that in on a piece of paper. I know some of you have done some extra lab work and I've been conversing with it, we've talked about it, but it would be helpful to have it um, on a piece of paper to remind me. Um, there, for the last quiz, there were, there were, I made a key for the quiz and a lot of people didn't pick them up and maybe you had perfect paper so you didn't need to. But uh, what people that didn't get them, they're here. I think you might not have realized that's what they were. Mr. Donnelly here? I got your place. Oh, one thing I would like to clear up, um, an error was made in the in the lab section last week when we had the demonstration talking about uh, different quick methods for evaluating viable yeast. And I talked to you a little bit about the nuclear pore method, which had just, uh, I'd just gotten in my hands and had, had, had not had a good chance to read it. I made some errors uh, for, I think it was the afternoon section. One thing is that these nuclear pore membranes are such that they don't need to be cleared, that you, they're more or less transparent, so you can use light from underneath them rather than light, instant light from the top. You can do this with millipore, by the way. You can clear them by adding different organic solvents, especially toluene or even immersion oil. But it doesn't last a long time. Uh, it evaporates away. But the nuclear pore membrane, you can use the light from underneath. And they do, the most important part is that they do claim to tell the difference between live and dead cells. Now, they don't say what kinds of stains they're using. It's a kit. You buy the whole kit. Um, and they haven't told me, but I suspect that it's a methylene blue stain too because they're talking about uh, red and blue stains, but I don't know that. The other announcement is the final will be next Tuesday from four to six. Wild time for a final, isn't it? Um, you'll be held for everything except the things that you're not held for, the things you don't have to memorize, uh, like the lactic acid uh, species, um, the yeast, that chart that you had to memorize before, you won't have that again. But you may, I may ask some questions, I certainly will ask one question at least from the midterm or the quiz. So it will be helpful to study those. Maybe not in exactly that same term, words, but very close to it. What, what chart is it? Oh, the chart of the wine yeast genera that I insisted that you memorize for the midterm, one time only shot. Well, I'll keep my word. <laughs> um, you don't have to. You've memorized it. You don't have to memorize it again. No, you won't be held for specific things on that. Okay. Today, since we are going to have a discussion uh, this afternoon, I think we'll go right into uh, uh, the lecture for today. Oh, I guess we won't. Yes. On the inositol assimilation, yes. what was the concentration that you used? 2%. Usually on any of those sugars, you use 2%. Now, final concentration. If you're using sucrose, you would use 4% because you want 2% of of the sugars is going to be fermented. And if you're using raffinose, you do 6%. So you have 2% of, of, of each of the individual sugars. Yes, all right. Are you going to pass back the 
Yeah, I won't. I made a mistake. I should have brought in one, the ones I had corrected today. But I thought, well, I don't want to turn some back in until they're all done because I haven't read them all. But you turned them in at different times, so that isn't that that isn't a good uh, uh, way of looking at it. So I'll bring them in tomorrow. All of them that I have done, I'll, I think I'll have them all done by tomorrow. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Well, I had have a lot of them done, and I thought, well, that's not fair to bring in part of them. But it would have been fair because a lot of people turned them in early. No. Okay. Be that as it may. Okay, today we want to talk about, hopefully, fusel oil, which could take a long time, but we'll try to make it short. And then microbes of, of grapes themselves. We talked about fermenting must, but we haven't really talked about the microbes on grape itself. And on filters. I think that there was a lack in, in uh, some of your appreciation of the different kinds of filters, and I hope we can get to that today, too. Well, for fusel oil, I think I have to give you some objectives uh, for the lecture. We don't have any lab uh, experiment on this, so there's no, nothing in these handouts for objectives, so I think I better give them to you before we begin. And they would be, for fusel oils, I want to know what are they. And we want to know how they are formed. And that would include metabolic pathways, and metabolic control, that is internal inside the cell itself, and then environmental control, how you can have some effect on their formation. And I think that if we can figure those two things out, subdivided into three here, I think we'll have done our um, work. Well, uh, some of you, I think, have had uh, a lot of this information before, but hopefully it'll be good review for you. But a lot of people, a lot of you, I think, have not. Well, what are they? They're um, first historically the fusel oil comes from the idea that you get an oil, if you do some distillations and get rid of alcohol from a wine, then you will get, end up with an oily material that stinks, kind of, and that's where the word comes from, the German word meaning kind of a, a foul spirit or foul smell. And it's early when the chemists started looking at it, they came up with the most of the components, the largest number, largest amount of the components were made up of isobutyl alcohol, isoamyl alcohol, and active amyl alcohol. Um, now this is kind of an interesting story in itself about active amyl alcohol. We have to want to go back to a minute to our hero, uh, Mr. Pasteur. I don't know if you know this story that he had a graduate student his, whose father was having problems with his uh, fermentations or alcoholic fermentation. They were fermenting uh, beet sugar and distilling it. And they were getting a um, um, Lactic, apparently lactic acid spoilage in it. And so he looked, he wasn't really interested in this at all at that time. Uh, saved his life, didn't it? But uh, he did uh, look at it uh, since he liked his graduate students, as all professors like their graduate students. And one thing that he found that was very interesting when he looked, just happened, one of the things he looked at was the fusel oil components and found that there was active amyl alcohol or a compound that was optically active. And he had previously decided uh, with his work on tartaric acid that any chemical that was optically active must be biological in origin, must have been from a living situation. And so he surmised then that this somehow in this process, it was a live, a live process. And it's not like the apple falling on Newton's head, but he uh, probably, this is an evolutionary development, but he credits this as some of the spark in coming up with the idea that fermentation, in this case, it was a, uh, it, he was looking at the spoilage, but in fact, these were coming from the yeast itself. But his, this, he credits this with the idea, the uh, first idea that the alcoholic fermentation was a living process. <clears throat> Actually, most of the component, maybe 60% of the fusel oil, is this one here. We'll say about 60% and then divided here and here between chunks uh, amongst the others. There are smaller amounts of other ones, and we'll come to that in a minute. 
Okay, it's very difficult to study these. Um, they were, some people have studied them since Pasteur's time up to the last 20 years, but they're very hard to measure. There are alcohols, there isn't a good way to get a specific color reaction for one as compared to another. And it wasn't until the advent of gas liquid chromatography that people really could do a lot of work with these and come up with ideas of, of how they're, to analyze them easily and find out how they're made. Uh, the metabolic uh, pathway for them and uh, how to control them perhaps. But we might just see just how important these are. Now we know that these are used in this, these distill over for brandy, so they become pretty important in brandy uh, uh, fermentation, brandy production. But we're, in terms of wine, just how important are they? Well, probably not too important. The total amount you might get might be, remember what we got in lab, we got uh, maybe figures, if we added those all together, maybe figures of the most 50 milligram percent, or which is equivalent to 500 parts per million little bit low, so somewhere between 500 and 1,000 parts per million is the amount of fusel oils that you, that you get. Now what is the, the taste threshold? This data hasn't really been worked out very well, but Dr. Rankin, our old friend again, uh, has done some taste analysis work with the fusel oils in wine and in, and in water, and he found a great variability amongst tasters. He had about 10 tasters and there was a big variability, but he gave the threshold of about uh, 300 parts per million for isobutyl alcohol and greater than 500 for, he didn't separate these, he just put these together, commercial formation of the, it's commercial um, a source of the amyl alcohols together. So it's just, in wine, it's just about on the on threshold or less than threshold. And it, does, it doesn't become important really until you get into brandy. But still, you people are going to be making distilling material, maybe, depending on your job. Uh, some of you certainly are going to be involved in making distil distilling material from time to time. So it's something you should know something about. Um, I put the N-propanol in brackets. It's in uh, Brandy, it's not very important because you usually lose this during the distillation. But in wine itself, it would account to maybe 10% of the total. So we want to include that in our discussion too. This is our first discussion of brandy and perhaps our last one. But there is one other interesting, important part of brandy production that you as winemakers should be aware of. Um, and that is, we've talked about the use of uh, SO2 a lot, and we use how we can use SO2 to solve our problems as far as spoilage goes. But you have to bear in mind that if you're going to be making distilling material, you want to keep your SO2s very low. And these are the very wines which may be likely to spoil. Why do we want to keep the SO2s especially low for brandy production? Well, what's wrong with that? Well, there's more to it than that. Anybody know? Yeah. No, it's because it's highly corrosive on the on the still. I mean, it's hot SO2. So that's. Well, I knew we shouldn't get in brandy production. <laughs> I know that they do like copper, but I, I maybe for sulfides. I'm not sure. I think it's for sulfides or the SO2. Uh, yeah. That's one of the things we'll have to discuss about the yeast, uh, the yeast strain effect, and we'll go into that in just a minute. Okay. Um, well, we're, I think we've discussed what they are. Let's go. How are they formed? The metabolic pathway, fortunately for us, has been very well worked out, so we can get through with that right away and talk about that. The the control mechanism is not so easy. Um, you might just. We see here we have alcohols here. We might just assume that these are going to be somewhat analogous to ethanol production. And, and let's just see if we can give an anal analogous uh, situation here. If we have ethanol, let's put ethanol over here. And where does that come from? We know, don't we? Acetaldehyde. Ooh, if I can write it. Okay, and where does that come from? Well, before that. Thank glucose, very good. Pyruvate, decarboxylation of pyruvate, right? So what we're having here, if for ethanol at least, we have a, a decarboxylation 
of an alpha keto acid to give us a corresponding aldehyde of one carbon less. And then this is reduced with NAD to give us alcohol. Well, maybe we can get some, something like the same thing here. Let's write this. The, this is the isobutyl alcohol. So we'll make the corresponding aldehyde. which is um, isobutyl, isobutyl, isobutyl aldehyde. Now if we put an, uh, another carbon on that, have I done this right? Yeah, put another carbon on that, make it a keto acid. We have this compound, I'll erase this. This is alpha keto isovaleric acid. Well, can you guess where that might come from? You know anything about alpha keto acids? Hmm? From what? <laughs> what about alpha keto acids? Where's your biochemistry? Remember? Uh, Transamination, right. So if this had been transaminated, we'd have this compound, I'm not sure if it's D or L. Yeah, very good. Oops, oops. Yeah. And what is this? It's amino acid. It's valine. And the same thing would happen, if you think about it, with pyruvate. It can go to alanine here. Or it can come from alanine. Well, now if you look at these and see these compounds, you f see that they all have a corresponding uh, amino acid analog. This one is valine. This one is um, leucine. And this one is isoleucine. This one has a corresponding amino acid, not, not one of the common ones, but one that does occur naturally, alpha amino butyric acid important in grapes, one of the big, one of the most important amino acids in grapes, outside of proline and arginine. And with this in mind then, people thought, well, let's look at, see if there's other kinds of uh, compounds maybe made the same way. And it is. They found for, for um, phenyl phenylalanine, you have a corresponding one called phenethyl alcohol. You know that one, I think. What does it smell like? Right. And another one for, for tyrosine called tyrosol. Tyrosine. And the, the important thing, this is quite a breakthrough, because this you can do a specific color reaction for, whereas the others you can't. And so a lot of the information we know about the pathway and about the control, first of all, came from tyrosol, tyrosine to tyrosol, which is a very small, uh, minor amount compared to these others, but still enough that we could... Uh, get some information on it. There are a lot of other um, minute amounts of uh, compounds which we can say, which we can say have uh, come from transaminations, decarboxylations, and reductions in the same way. How yep. about from the sulfur uh, No, there isn't. Yeah. Well, there may be. Sure, I shouldn't say that. There may be a low concentration. It's a good question. We'll see if we can look that up. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, I wonder if that's really true now. We'll get to that. This mechanism, by the way, from here over to here is called the Ehrlich reaction because it was discovered by Ehrlich around the turn of the century. And this was considered the way that fusel oils were formed in, during fermentation. But then some genius people at Davis decided, well, let's find out. It doesn't seem quite reasonable. when. We'd ha we end up with more fusel oil than we had amino acid to start with. Can that really be the case? And it turns out that, that, that while this reaction does occur, it may not, it is not the only way that they discovered in the last, since gas liquid chromatography, when these things could be really studied very well, found out that this does, th that these fusel oils can come not only from the amino acids themselves, but from this intermediate, which in which in turn comes from someplace else. Where does pyruvate come from? Who said that earlier? 
What did you say? You're close. That's very good. Where would the where would the alpha keto isovaleric acid come from? No, not really. No. Hmm. Sure. Well, it comes from actually uh, aspartic acid. Aspartic acid, which is which can which gives you throws off a lot of amino acids on the way, including what what are some of the amino acids that come off here? on the way. You mentioned the sugar, the sulfur-containing ones. You get methionine and also uh, lysine and uh, threonine. These are all different, coming from aspartic acid. But where, where does aspartic acid come from? This is the operative sentence. Yeah, but where did it come from ultimately? Hmm? It comes out of the Krebs cycle. Right, that's the point. It comes out of the Krebs cycle. Psh, I have the Krebs cycle here, okay? So it means, remember we talked about the importance of having the Krebs cycle for building, building blocks. If, that if you don't have grape juice, if you have a synthetic medium, you have to have the operative TCA cycle to be able to get some building blocks, including aspartic acid, giving you all these things, and giving you alpha keto valeric acid, which will go to valine. Well, no, let's, we're going to come to that, but that's a good question. The little shot of oxygen you know doesn't do this because it's in, not in winemaking condition because the glucose is there to repress the formation of the Krebs cycle. So we're still in the mystery about, as far as uh, the effect of oxygen, relationships to the Krebs cycle, all we can say is that the, org the organism better have these things present, and it does in grape juice, right? The aspartic acid in, during winemaking conditions, I mean. Is, then the aspartic acid is at high concentrations during, during the fermentation? No, not, not, not very much made. Yeah, because there's no made. Right, that's right. But d again, during winemaking conditions, we don't have to worry about that because we have enough of these filling blocks. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We'll get to that now. We're still on the pathway, though. That has to do with control mechanism. We're still on the pathway. Now, let's. <clears throat> well, I think actually we've 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 finished the pathway. We know that we can get these fusel oils from from the amino acid itself or from glucose to give you pyruvate, or from uh, aspartic to give you alpha keto valeric acid. But, well, no, we haven't really finished the pathway. Let's just show what happens, uh, how we get, um, well, I'll put that one down in just a minute. <laughs> we've, we've only talked about two of the fusel oils so far. And how do we get from, uh, Let's say we have uh, pyruvate, again, I'm, I'm going to write it out. Now, you know, this will form an acid aldehyde, a TPP complex, and then this can con condense. We'll just write it as the acid aldehyde. And this will give you a, a acetolactate. Are you condensing this one? So it's an enzyme. <laughs> Condensing enzyme in in the cell. Uh, this is well. This is actually with uh, with the um, it's an active acid aldehyde. It's a combination with the with the thymine pyrophosphate. We're going to what we're going to do is go from steps from here to the uh, alpha keto acid. So we have. Now this this reaction can. Hmm? Is that C oil? C O H. O H. No, 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 no. Oh. That's the oil and fusel oil. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> this is uh, acetal acetal lactate. Now. 
this can go through a couple of uh, transformations here, and you end up with the compound we had before, the alpha keto isovaleric acid. And then, as we showed before, this can go to valine. Now, the same kind of reaction can occur with the corresponding alpha keto acid here, alpha keto uh, butyl alcohol, uh, but uh, butyric acid, also condensing, giving you the corresponding alpha keto acid here, one more carbon, and this giving us what? It's giving us uh, isoleucine, right? Now, the control mechanisms on this is very is rather interesting. These are the same enzymes here carrying out this reaction from these different starting materials. And this end product here, valine or isoleucine, can feed back inhibit the first enzyme and prevent the formation of the end products. Now feedback inhibition works. This takes care of this is this, involved, this is a, one of the control mechanisms of the formation of the amino acids themselves. Pardon me? What does the... Right, right. Or to the first enzyme, which is the same enzyme. I should say that this information is obtained from bacteria, although it's true in yeast too. But the bacteria don't make fusel oils. So right now we'll just talk about control mechanism of the amino acids first and then bring in the uh, fusel oils. It won't? Oh, that's the same thing, isn't it? Excuse me. Very good. This should be the one carbon analog. Now there's one other pathway which is different from this we haven't talked about that takes off here. And goes to the corresponding alpha keto acid for the uh, leucine. Uh, and this then will go to leucine. Yeah. Now this also will give feedback inhibition to this to this enzyme. So the, the cell can control the formation of amino acid production if it doesn't want to make extra amounts of amino acids or if it has amino acids in the grape juice medium itself. It can be prevented from making more or wasting uh, skeletons by this feedback inhibition process. There's one other uh, mechanism we have to discuss too though. This normally takes place in the cells when there's metabolic um, functions. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, if the, if the enzyme is not there, you don't get the condensation. This, are the enzymes inactive in the presence of these amino acids? Now, these enzymes, the feedback inhibition means that the end, first enzyme is inhibited, right? But you can also prevent the formation of these uh, enzymes, and this is probably what happens most of the time, by repression, by uh, end product repression. It's a very unusual one in this case. It's called multivalent repression. and requires all three of these amino acids. If any one of them is there, it doesn't work. So if all three of these amino acids are present, then none of these enzymes is formed. From this multivalent repression. Now just how important is this in yeast? We know that it's really important in bacteria. But in yeast, the experiments we have done show that it does operate, but it's not, not, really, big, not really important. Not so important as for the bacteria. Do you know why? Why are, we, why are metabolic control mechanisms not nearly as important in yeast as they are in bacteria? Hmm? No, because this was the yeast, the bacteria were Escherichia coli, which aren't fastidious. So. Now we're bacteriologists and and, uh, and mycologists in this course. We should know what that difference. Can you think what's the, what's a big difference between yeast and bacteria? Well, that's not it. Anyway, that's true. 
What else? Think about the size of them. What does that mean? What? That's true, but that's not the point. It, you have lots of metabolic uh, pools in the yeast. Lots of storage material. Remember we had this problem when we were doing the, uh, the tests for the assimilation of nitrate and uh, for the different sugars. There's a lots of, lot of pools in the yeast, so that means they don't need such stringent control mechanisms as the bacteria do. The bacteria go from one medium to another. They have to either shut off their, their, their certain synthesis so they wouldn't waste materials, or they have to really start making something because they don't have any pools. So they have to have strong metabolic control mechanisms. But yeast don't need that so much because of the, they have lots of, they store a lot of material. Is there, this is the third pathway to making uh, two well, these are, for, these are three, we're talking about the amino acids right now, but these are correspond to three different fusel oils. Right, but I mean, third way that you're making a fusel oil? Uh, no. Well, okay, it depends where you start from. Let's take that up now. If you, the point is that for, uh, for uh, amino acids you do this. What if you want to make fusel oils? You start back here one step and you do a decarboxylation and a reduction and we get uh, isoamyl alcohol here. And here, the same thing, we would get um, active amyl. And here we would get isobutyl. So now to answer your question, we can see there are two ways to make uh, fusel oils. One is you could do the Ehrlich mechanism from valine transaminated through this intermediate down over this way. The same thing here. And the same thing here. And presumably for all the others, the minor constituents. Or the other way would be from glucose itself coming into here as pyruvate or um, alpha ketobutyric acid going along in here. And the only thing that's missing is what? What you need. Well, yeah. No, you have to do Krebs cycle for this too. But what, what else is missing to form an amino acid from all this, from, from glucose? You need a source of ammonia. And that's what we have to get to in a minute to talk about that. So, okay. Yes, so what are the two ways now? Okay. Let's just take let's take this one right here. Isobutyl alcohol. Two ways it can be it can be formed. One is by the Ehrlich mechanism. From valine, valine itself can be transaminated to the alpha keto acid and then decarboxylated and reduced. Think in terms of let's put in parentheses alanine. Right, a little more familiar. Alanine, pyruvate and ethanol. The same kind of reaction. Or the other way, it can come from glucose itself, where you get pyruvate and active acid aldehyde condensing, going through this uh, different transformation to the alpha keto acid, and then being transaminated. Yeah. So are you saying that whenever you have amino acid formation, you're going to get some fusel oil formation too? That, well, that's, we, haven't, we haven't come to that, grips to that. Have we? That's, the, that's what we have to decide. We have to find out what happens here. How does the yeast decide which way it's going to go? Is it going to, if it's going this way, is it going to make it all amino acids, or is it going to make it all fusel oils, or is it going to split it down the middle? Uh, we haven't come. Yeah. I meant to say the other way that if you have a surplus of amino acids, you'd likely get. Like well, oils that's what people have often said. We have to. We have to come. We have to talk about that. That's in the control mechanism. Yeah. What? What enzymes are repressed in, multi in this multi Okay. The enzymes that are repressed are all of these from the substrate to the alpha keto acid. But the end product inhibition is always, I mean, I don't think anybody's found any exceptions, is always on the first enzyme. Yeah. Uh, the alkyl acids that uh, involved in the synthesis of fusel oil come from, uh, comes out of the TCA section, right? Well, the one, the, um, the one for uh, this one here. Uh, sorry, yeah. Well, it seemed to me that in the one way of repressing fusel oil, so you said if you uh, group 
screw your yeast in the absence of oxygen, you're not going to get the synthesis of the mitochondria, and therefore you won't have a TCA cycle. So yeah. That so if you, if you grew in the absence of oxygen, you wouldn't get fusel oil. Well, as a matter of fact, oxygen, that, that is true, that um, oxygen stimulates fusel oil formation. But I don't think it's as simple as that, because why isn't that? What you're saying is in the absence of oxygen, this, I'm going to get this anyway, so we can talk about it now. You're saying in the absence of oxygen, you don't have the Krebs cycle in operating, right? So you wouldn't, yeah, yeah, you don't have the mitochondria synthesized, so you wouldn't have some of these building blocks for that, right? So the alternative to that is in the presence of oxygen, you do have these operating, right? But we know that's not so, don't we? Remember? That was an important point, that this is, you learn this in all your courses about what oxygen is going to do, but for, for us enologists, it doesn't work. You know, you're, uh, when you drop your oxygen, yeah. you're drawing it in presence. Of and what else? High glucose, but still yeah. Okay, that's important. That's the important part. Well, that's the point of having a TCA cycle. You will have a TCA cycle. No, you won't. And Not if the glucose is there. That's the whole point. Think about it again. Well, let's go over that again. Because you have a repression, but you, you have a repression of usage, but you still have presence. No, you don't. That's the whole point. In the presence of glucose, you don't have any of this. All the things that oxygen is supposed to do doesn't work for us because we have the glucose there. Is that only the yeast? Because I know bacteria do have it because either it's required for, uh, you know, for uh, active transport and they can still contain, uh, still perform active transport in the presence of oxygen. Well, um, some people say that a bacteria is a mitochondria in itself. That's a little bit different situation. I think. My, bacteria don't have mitochondria in, in any case. Yeah, yeah. I know. But mm -hmm. so no, this is an important point and it's confusing because it's, it's just contrary to what we've, been, what we've been told all the time. Yeah. Well, that's that seems to be the ultimate control mechanism. We'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, the, uh, the nitrogen effect. Yeah. So you're saying, I thought that in the presence of glucose, it's a matter of repression of your not repression of your enzymes, but uh, of your no, no. Right. The mitochondria are repressed. There is no formation. They used to think they could find some sort of pro-mitochondria, but that doesn't seem to be true. It seems to be staining, uh, staining problems. Okay. Well, we've talked a little bit about, about some metabolic control mechanism. We said the one that ordinarily would operate for the amino acids probably isn't very important in yeast because none, no none of these kinds of control mechanisms are very important. But still, there must be some, we do know we can get larger or smaller amounts of fusel oils, under, even if we don't know the conditions, we know that it does happen, that some wines have more than others. So what is happening? Well, somebody suggested that maybe the, the somebody here suggested that maybe the control comes here. We have this alpha keto acid, and it's got to make, a decision has to be made whether it's going to go mostly to valine or if it's going to go mostly to iso, um, isobutyl alcohol. Now, what kinds of things can we look at that would be important here? Yeah, okay, the amount of alpha keto acid, right? And it happens that this is controlled. And the, the oxygen has an effect on this, that at high levels of oxygen, you stimulate the formation of these alpha keto acids. Now, how that can be, we'll come back to oxygen in a minute. Nobody, I don't think anybody's prepared to say how that can be that oxygen stimulates, what's the mechanism for that. Another thing we might think about, though, would be, remember this step here, the second step, is going to be a reoxidation of reduced NAD. And we might think, then, this might be a way for the cell to reoxidize NADH. This might be part of the control mechanism. If this is of some redox effect, then we come up to our, our friend, which we've already gone over it again once, but we should go over it again, the effect the role of oxygen in this decision. And it does happen that oxygen does stimulate the formation of fusel oils, formation of higher alcohols. Now, this seems kind of unusual, doesn't it, when you think about it? Although um, Paul said he figured it out right in the first place that you should that, that low amounts of oxygen, you shouldn't get uh, much fusel oil, and that was a good, good reasoning. But when you think about it another way, what about alcohol, ethyl alcohol? We've always been taught 
that oxygen does what to al ethyl alcohol formation? Right, represses it. So how is it that alcohol stimulates fusel oil formation? It seems to be just backwards. It seems to be that it must be under some other control mechanism. But the fact is, do we really know if oxygen represses ethanol formation under winemaking conditions? I don't think we do. All we know is the information we have under low levels of, low levels of glucose. Remember what happens now in the Pasteur effect. I, we should go over this again because it's important enough. When you start, when you induce with oxygen, what happens? The cell, the cell starts to use glucose in a different way. You can use it more efficiently. Make a lot of ATP. This ATP puts on brakes, which is the Pasteur effect. We've talked about that already. But it puts on these brakes and slows down the utilization of glucose. And so therefore, we think it's going to slow down the um, formation of ethanol. But all these experiments that have been done like that have been done at very low levels of glucose, not under winemaking conditions. And I think it just needs to be done yet to see whether what oxygen does at the uh, oxygen does at the formation for the formation of ethanol under winemaking conditions. Can you just run experiments where they test it at really you know, super low concentrations of, of oxygen and then just regulating the amount? Yeah, and actually that's what Mr. Traverso was doing. <laughs> we don't have the results yet. Okay, Paul. Oh. And that's right. That's right. Under anaerobic conditions, you mean? No, say that again. Well, you no, no, excuse me. Anaerobic conditions, because if you completely repressed your TCA cycle, you're not oh. very rich media. Yeah, that's that. That's the other. That's the other confusing thing. That oxygen does have an effect. Remember, even in the presence of glucose, but the effect is not stimulation of the Krebs cycle or stimulation of the mitochondria. Well, then where, it's some, where are you going to get any of your important, uh, you know, meta, you know, I mean, yeah. if you're going to synthesize stuff to make your cells, you're yeah. going to have to have your TCA cycle. Uh, that's, that's, yeah. Unless you're in a very rich medium, which wine is, but I'm yeah. talking about, you know, if you just... Well, there is a problem in synthetic medium. We've gone through that too. It's been problems in synthetic medium unless you have some levels of, of oxygen, but they're very, very low levels, not enough to, to act in the same way. They're required, not enough to act for the formation of uh, unsaturated fatty acids or steroids. They must be acting in some other way. Well, like, um, how, how's it growing? How, how does your cell grow? How, you know, if, if you're not forming the tabloids, which you, which you mm. have to form through the TCA cycle, I don't see the you know, come about spontaneously. I mean, how's your cell growing? Mm. You're going to have to have your TCA yeah. cycle. There's just no way around it, unless unless there are unless all those metabolites are present immediately. We're missing a, a link in the puzzle, aren't we, at the moment? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, no, no, that that's true. But we're talking. Uh, Paul's got a good point on very on on synthetic medium, which you do need to have some oxidation, some oxygen for growth. So, could yeah. it just be, be like leaky? Oh, oh, they, but they, oh, the, well, okay. In other words, it's going to have to be a small level. And, it, and in fact, they don't grow as well, and they don't ferment to dryness yeah. on synthetic medium, with 20% with with glucose. Mm -hmm. You have to do, that's right, that's the point. You have to use very low levels of glucose, not, uh, un, say, unrepressed levels, in other words, to get them to grow. Right. right. So it, it, it does shut off. Right, right. Kill yourself. Right, or they don't grow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or they go very, very slowly. Yeah. So you can have like, actually, you just sort of cut down the concentration of the enzymes, so it's not going to really shut off these days. Well, uh, uh, I think it's hard to demonstrate these. At, and the people that look for them have had trouble finding them. Now, maybe yes. they're very small levels of it's, it's Again, if you're waiting a long period, long enough time, they will, yeah. you so will get a very tiny amount. Yeah. Basal levels well, the other thing that, that seems to have a role here is the ammonia itself. That if the cell is, say, needs ammonia from these amino acids here, that it will, and doesn't need the amino acids, there's plenty of those, it can transaminate those and use the ammonia for something else and you get fusel oils. But uh, maybe, it, it maybe it has excess of ammonia and then it wouldn't make the fusel oils, and it goes to the, to the amino acids. And this seems to be part of the control mechanism. You can control by the amount of ammonia that is present. Suppose you increased the amount of ammonia, but it wasn't organic. It was 
or it wasn't inorganic. It wasn't in the form of an amino acid. No, I'm talking about ammonia. Ammonium. Ammonium. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, if you had a mixture. Well, the other amino it's true. The other amino acids can be transaminated right. and, and provide a source of ammonia. Um, the only other. That's part of the, we're talking. I think we have to think in terms of fusiloils. What happens? That I don't think the ammonia has so much effect on the on the amino acids as it does on the fusiloils itself. That if you have if you have a, a shortage of ammonia, you'll transaminate from some of these amino acids, and what you have left over are fusiloils. If you have excess ammonia, you're not going to have fusel oils. So much fusel oils are going to go be transaminated to amino acids. Yeah, right. Yeah. You, uh, you, don't, you don't ever shut these things off completely in a fermentation, no. I mean, let's say you wanted to, re you're making something exclusively for brand production. You want to cut down on a certain fusel oil. Would it be advisable to see the nitrogen content of the less is higher? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. People have thought about using mutants, too, to get a certain one down. I think you, you want to think about this in terms of wine production, too, that you, even though it is threshold, you don't want to have excess amino acids, uh, fusel oils for wine production, either. Well, there's only one other, uh, I was going to go into these enzymes themselves here, the kind of work that Mr. Singh is doing now, but I, I think I'll let that go. But there is one other, one other control that is known, is that for some reason at all, or, for some reason or other, the Ehrlich mechanism, this pathway, doesn't go during the log growth phase of, uh, of the yeast. It only becomes effective during the stationary. But that's, the log growth phase is only a very small part of the time we're interested in, in the fermentation time. Well, uh, two minutes to talk, ooh, talk about some of the practical, this is the, the control mechanisms in the cell itself. The practical effect itself um, the environmental effects, what you can do yourself. There's not a lot of information. The best is the paper by Rankin that's on that reading list that you have. And one of his things he points out very strongly is the difference in yeast strains, how you can get variability in fusel oils from various yeast strains. However, he's done this only under one set of conditions. And our experience has been quite a bit different, that if we use several yeast strains, we get certain amounts of uh, fusel oils one year, the next year we might get a different, different uh, formation, different amounts, a uh, variation in the amounts. And people in the industry will tell us, oh, uh, Montreché really gives a lot of fusel oil, and then they want to try champagne instead. And then they'll say, oh, no, the champagne give, gives more than, than the Montreché, but it didn't the year before. And it's that there are a lot of other conditions besides the yeast strain. I don't think the yeast strain is all that important, although it is, imp it is important. And Montreché does uh, consistently give a little bit higher results than some of the others. I, yeah? No, that's the point, that, that that hasn't been well controlled. But what Rankin did control, or did look at, was pH and temperature. And he studied pH for Australian wines is really interesting. He went clear down to 3.0, which is very rare here, much less in Australia, plus up to 4.2. And he found, and this seems to be true, lower pH gives lower amounts of fusel oil. We're talking about pH now. Yeah, lower fusel oil. Now, it's also true with temperature, though, that low temperature gives lower fusel oils also. So there is this, this kind of control mechanism. He studied um, uh, varieties and soil types, and probably including microclimates, and could come to no good uh, con uh, conclusions on that. But again, I, they didn't look at uh, amino acid uh, content. There is, that's all I'm going to say about it. There is some other fascinating work being, has been done on mutants. Uh, of any one of these pathways and see what effect those would have on the fermentation. But that would be a very unusual situation and hard, hard to handle under uh, practical winemaking conditions. But well, we'll have to leave the microbes on grapes till, uh, and filtration until next time then. So, um, oh, well, the, I don't think there's a class here now, so they're setting up the, uh, the fermentation room for VIT-3 or have just used it. So we'll have our discussion in here in about 10 minutes. So that's the afternoon
lab session. Thank you.